Ian Kabakovic, um, and I head up the engineering for Everyday Edison's. Personal background started out in the um, high tech world, uh, right out of school, actually end of school in school, working with atomic force microscopes for Toshiba and Intel, uh, working on their end of process inspection for their uh, high end processors. Uh, after that, went into um, more process equipment and did a lot of um, vapor deposition, chemical etch, and then quickly learned that had more fun with consumer products, so got into the consumer product world. So to become a consumer product engineer, you need to have a real diverse background uh, and that and interest as well. I mean, as a as a general consumer, you're probably working with things on a day-to-day -day basis that you you think that you can improve or you have ideas for improving upon. Uh, when I was working in the high tech world, I started um, helping out friends and, and colleagues that, that had ideas of their own and just got into to doing a lot of different products that uses, used a lot of different processes from manufacturing, from injection molding, stamping, um, extruding, vacuum forming. Each of these different processes has you know, a slightly different way of approaching that solution. So if you can embrace that and, and, and uh, find you know, joy and uh, something else that sounds good later, uh, it's, a, it's just a, a fun job to have. So the, the engineers and, um, and, and the Department of Engineering for Everyday Edison's is responsible for taking these concepts presented and bringing them into the physical realm. So out of, sometimes out of someone's head or out off the paper or working with Daniel and his concepts and bringing them into something tangible, something that we can finally you know, touch and feel and interact and, and decide if it's doing what it needs to do. So we're responsible for taking those concepts, giving them, you know, sort of breathing life into them and making them something workable and make sure that it's doing everything that all the other departments need it to do. So sales has a set of requirements where they need it to, to come in at a certain price point. Design has uh, aesthetics and, and certain features that, that drive the look of the product. And then we have the constraints of, of how this thing can be built, where it's going to be built, who the target customer is, and what safety standards, if any, it needs to apply to. So we have all these different perspectives that we're combining and hopefully putting it into one product and everything's embodied in that final product. That, that's our role and we've got a lot of different tools to do that. Um, we, we build early and often. Uh, we don't assume that just because it's working in CAD that it's going to work in real life. Uh, we're, we're pretty good at, at um, progressing an idea along but then we come back to our shop and we, we run things up on the CNC and we cut things out and we you know, we've got a lot of different tools. We're, we're fortunate in that, that we can very quickly get to a place where we can say, yeah, that idea is working, or no, that idea is not working. Go back into our CAD stations and, and make the corrections and just keep it rolling. The biggest challenge, and the one we face most frequently uh, after design is, is the client or the customer, or whoever has the most vested interest in that product has typically fallen in love with with one aspect of that product that they really really want to see in the in the end product and a challenge can be when that one feature or set of features is either driving the price too high or um, complicating things in one way or another and and we all I mean we're always doing our best to, to maintain that uh, but there's a lot of give and take and I, I'm sure Daniel will say the same thing where we'll come back with a, with a functioning solution that may have dropped a few of the things that, that he had spent a lot of time on. And we need to dialogue and come up collectively with that end solution that maintains as much of what was developed from the outset and the things that, that really helped the product from a, from a commercial viability and, and just a price point stance. So there's always this tug of war going back and forth and it's healthy. If it, if it didn't happen then, you know, either the products would, would have all sorts of you know, things that it may not need to function but are important aesthetically or it may just look like a, a purely engineered product and, and so we need that, we need that dialogue.
When it comes to building a prototype, there's so much that can be done by running to a home improvement store and, and cobbling stuff together. Um, sometimes our clients are, can be underwhelmed by the materials that we show them for the first prototype until they really hear the rationale behind it. So um, we had one inventor come to us and in our first prototype presentation was uh, duct tape, PVC, a couple of wood screws and he walked in and was wondering, he said, I could have done this in my, in my garage. And our answer was exactly, you probably should have because here's what we learned and we went through all of these different things of what we learned. Um, and how inexpensive it was to get that information. Sometimes I feel that, that um, we get approached to build a prototype and they expect there to be this immediate leap right to the finish line and it's not. It, you need to make sure that when you're building something you continue to learn. Like I said, we, we build early and we build often. So in our process we have a minimum of, of four prototyping rounds. <clears throat> that's a minimum. More often than not, I mean, if we counted like, like um, some others, <laughs> we, we would make innumerable number of tweaks to that. So we'll start with a prototype, and it can be a home improvement style prototype where it's just stuff we're pulling off the shelf. We're screwing it together, we see how it works, or just range of motion, or whatever. Uh, it depends on what you're doing, but there's a lot that could be done um, by anyone with with minimal mechanical sense. Get to the point where you say, yeah, this is kind of working, and then we flush it out and, and make, it, make it beautiful. But if, until it works, you, know, it, it, you need to make sure that uh, it does work before you really put those final touches on it. Cool. So you, and I can even keep going. And some of the um, prototypes you see on the show are very flushed out prototypes. You'll see some early, but then you see some later down the process where they're gonna look like real products. And that is a couple of reasons. One is we need to make sure that even in the final form it does everything and it's a complete looks like, works like. We're showing these to buyers and we can't ask them to, to make, you know, exceptions. You know, oh, this will be, you know, this will be shiny and this will work and this will do that. They don't want to hear that. They just want to see what the final thing is. But early in the process, I mean, you can, you, got a, you have a lot of latitude. So yeah, when we present to a buyer, they invariably have comments. And we just know that Dave's going to come back in here and he's going to say, you know, either they loved it, but, I mean, there's always this caveat. And we're kind of braced for that. Usually he says they love it, but, and they say something, and he says, and I also broke it. So you, regardless, we have to fix it. Uh, but it's, it's part of the process. We realize that. And sometimes we know it's as, as minimal as probably them being able to say, you know, I've got, I've got some idea in that as well. If it's a change of color, it's a change of size, um, whatever. In the end, it's got to get on the shelf. So if we just kind of sit back in our chair and are stubborn about it, it won't get on the shelf. And it's pretty easy to, to uh, find justification to incorporate their ideas. Some of the times, though, we need to remind you know, either the buyer or the department that's making the request the, the implications of their request. Um, it may drive the price up. You know, we presented a uh, product last year and, and the response back was it needs more features. That's fine, we're happy to put more features in, but it's our obligation to come back and say, you know, if you want um, this product to do, you know, everything it does plus X, Y, and Z, well, you know, X costs $1.50, Y is another 30 cents and Z is another 85 cents, you know, the price just went up significantly, do you still want it? And we're obligated to do that such that we can make rational decisions. It's not just a, I need it regardless. It's, nothing's ever like that. It's, it's being able to say, yes, it's worth, you know, the extra two bucks or whatever it is for the sake of the product. A lot of things you aren't going to see on the show are the ones that, you know, where not much progress is evident in a, in a fairly short clip. And that's gonna be the time that it takes you to, to sit and reflect and, and make those sometimes difficult decision of where does the hole go? How big is the hole? What type of hardware should we be using? Um, is that hardware 
specific to a certain industry. Like in, uh, in for the sake of Skate Scepter, everything needs to be metric and probably the same size bolt everywhere. Uh, that's just how the, the bike industry and the, that scooter industry works. That's going to be different than when we're doing injection molding. Uh, so there's a lot of time spent injection molding on all the, the draft analysis. I mean, you guys don't want to sit there when, we, when we're hemming and hawing between half a degree and a degree and a half. It's, it's difficult to, uh, to capture what we're even doing. Uh, so there's that sort of thing. So it's mostly just those kind of decision points. Um, what you're going to see on the show is the reaction to those decisions and did those decisions work or not. Uh, scenes where you'll see, you know, hopefully most of the things working and some scenes where it's not working and we need to go back and make those difficult decisions. There is a lot of dialogue that's happening between inner department and between engineering specifically and our manufacturers, regardless of the location. So we, we have our office in Asia that, that uh, Jeff and I work with pretty frequently. That's difficult to capture, but there's a lot of dialogue. Um, with our designs, we're taking things to a point where we can have that dialogue. We don't want to call up a factory and say, here's an idea, it's still full of problems, you go solve them. We want to take that on and solve the problems here, present them a complete set of, of working drawings, a prototype that reflects all those drawings, and say, here's our product, what will it cost um, to build it to these specs? Or are you able to build it to this cost because that's the cost that, that will make or break. And each manufacturer is going to have a, a sweet spot or a specialty. Uh, there's, there's times where we need to be able to embrace that. So if, if they're you know, better at one process than another, uh, we can augment our design in some cases to leverage that and, and save ourselves some dollars. So uh, you really have to be flexible right up into the point where you're running parts out of, out of tools. So it's, the dialogue never ceases and that's something that may not be all that entertaining on the, uh, on the show. A couple of suggestions for, for would-be inventors or inventors are, um, you know, go out and search as thoroughly as you're able the, the, the landscape that you're considering approaching. Uh, we have a lot of people approach us that are almost afraid to fire up Google just because they, they know if they find it, their dream is, is done. Um, and that's, that's rarely the case. If you, if you find it, A, you can go buy it and save yourself a bunch of <laughs> time and effort because it's there. And if you needed it that bad, well, there you go. Um, or B, you can go out and see what, what other holes exist. Um, oftentimes, we'll find something very similar to, to what uh, we were approached with but are able to, to re you know, like we stated earlier, reapproach that problem and come at it from a completely different angle. Um, not knowing what, out, what else is out there is going into it blind, and we don't ever suggest you go into something blind. Also, I suggest that, uh, you know, build whatever you're able. Uh, it, it helps solidify the idea in your own mind and then communicate the idea to whoever's going to progress the idea, whether it's yourself or whoever you you know, investors that you're going to meet with or um, companies like us. We want to know what, what you've tried, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Um, and it's, it's, it's not that difficult um, to, to get to a point where you know, yeah, this might work or, or it won't work. You know, hot glue guns, popsicle sticks, buckets, duct tape, PVC. I mean, these are all perfectly acceptable prototype materials.